We have finally arrived in our final episode. When you say, wait, what? F final episode? Have I missed something? Yeah, I created already four other videos that are basically leading to this kind of video. You can definitely watch this one first because it also works without knowing the other ones. And I'll do a quick recap once I started to dive really deep into the topic. But if you want to have the full picture, then you can check out the links in the description where you can find the links to the four other videos what we have achieved. We started out to, to look for event data in our current data model, in our data warehouse. Why did we want to have event data? Because in the end, we wanted to bring together the subscription data that we get from Stripe, which is in our data warehouse, and we want to combine it with the behavioral data that we already have in Mixpanel. We started to work with the Stripe data in our data warehouse. We're extracting events from the data, then preparing the events, then loading them up into Mixpanel, there, we combined everything in the last video to already create really good metric dashboards, which was really nice. But in the end, this is not where we wanted to stop. So for me, I take the whole effort to basically bring this all together because I want to analyze the sequences. So like the events that one account or one user have, like what they do within the app and then how it relates to the subscription. And this is the reason why I wanted to have both of them in event shape and then brought together. Because then I can see if specific user behavior has an impact on subscription, which we all might agree, yes, there should be some kind of impact on that. And this is what we do today. So today we check specific kind of reports. So we will look into funnels. We will create cohorts that are super helpful then for our marketing team to work with specific kind of segments of people where we are a little bit afraid that we might lose them because like they have a subscription, but they don't really do stuff. This video is sponsored by Mixpanel. Mixpanel has a new way to do product analytics with your warehouse data. You can connect Mixpanel to your data warehouse and then you can run all the product analytics investigations and all the product analytics deep dives on top of your data warehouse data with clean, prepared and high quality data. Check out the link in the description to learn more about the offering. I'm using it and I'm extremely happy to have this new kind of setup for product analytics because it unlocks so many more use cases on top of much better data than before. But before we do this, we want to enrich the data even a bit more. So maybe you can remember we already synced up all the event data in the last video into Mixpanel. What we haven't synced up yet is we have some more information about our users and about our accounts. And, and so we start with this so that in the end, like we enrich the user profiles within a mixed panel because we need this information later to make really good breakdowns of the analysis that we are starting to do. Let's start with that, but I would quickly start with a quick recap what we have achieved so far, and then we jump into enriching user properties, and then we do proper analysis. So let's go. Okay, so to quickly recap, the last video, as you can see here, so we have different kind of event types already in our system. So these like board closed, board created. So again, we are still talking about a whiteboard app. And so we have specific kind of events from that that are basically collected, that collect the behavior within the application. But then we also have the subscription events that we have here that we synced up from our data warehouse. And so this is the place where we go now too. Because I added something that can help us to get more information about the users and the accounts that they have. So let's have a quick look first into BigQuery so they can see what we're talking about. I have another table that is new in the data model, which in the end takes some information from the subscription and also like from backend systems and prepares them into user properties. So how does it look like? Let's have a quick preview. We need the user ID because this is how it matches up in Mixpanel. So this has to be the user ID that we also use as an identifier in Mixpanel. So in our case, it's our user ID. So of course, like this matches in the end. What I decided to bring in is, so I have some information about the country where this account basically is coming from, where they're registered. And then I have the information about the marketing source. So this is something that we save when people are start, uh, signing up for their account. So we save the la last touch point before they sign up. And so this is helpful for the marketing team to analyze which kind of campaigns are bringing the people into subscription. And then in the end, we have a subscription type so subscription type is important for us because like, we need to know who is on a paid plan right now and who is on a free plan. So we can derive this also like, from the events. We could, for example, build a segment on that to see. But 
In the end, I always like to have this also as a user property because it's usually a lot easier to work with this. As you will see in a minute, it's pretty easy to sync up user properties constantly into Mixpanel to enrich our user information. Okay, so this is what we want to do. So we want to get this information into Mixpanel, so to match it up with the existing users, which are there. Let's go back. And we do it in the same place where last time we already added our event data. So we go here into project settings. Then again, we have the area with warehouse data and warehouse sources. So warehouse sources is still, it's the one that we already created. And then warehouse data is, in the end, what we have here. And so the only thing what we have to do now is we create something new. So in this case, we don't create an event table. In this case, we create a user table. The difference is that, as I told you, it's like we are not looking for events, we are just looking for additional user properties that get matched with the user information, which is already a mixed panel. Again, we pick the source, so we have this one. Then we pick our table, which is this one. No. Then we pick our data set, which is this one. And then we have the user properties. And so again, like Mixpanel already starts to analyze the structure. And so by that, for example, they already recognize, okay, the user ID is our distinct ID, but we definitely need the user properties. So we look for the JSON properties, which are our user properties. And as you can see here, so this is really nice. I really love the preview here. Here that you can already see that what was before a JSON object is now basically split up into three new properties that we have, which is great. We get this kind of information. Then we can make a decision how we want to sync it up. We have three different sync modes. And so time-based means it's basically the same like with the events. This would just sync up the new record. So this means we just get information about new users. Doesn't really make sense for us because like, we have things that can change. So for example, subscription type can change over time. Yes, marketing source country should be static because unless someone changes their country. Marketing source is static because we save it at the point of time when someone signs up. Especially like subscription type is something that can change. And so time base is definitely not something we are looking for. Full sync is in the end like we rerun the import every time, a full import, and we override everything. So this is definitely something that is better for us because this makes sure that this kind of type is basically always applied. We go for full sync. We could also just do one upload at a time when we just want to do it now. But in our case, like full sync totally makes sense. And then we can decide so in the end, like right now, the only frequency when we want to do full sync is like on a weekly base, which is totally fine for us. So we create this. And again, import is running. And as we know from the other one already, it's pretty fast. So as you can see here, so this is already like the import process is. So the import is in process and we have it ready. So as you can see here, it was two minutes in the end, so not really long. And if this is now on, let's say we have a full sync, it works weekly, weekly so it just runs in the background. So you, you will not really even recognize it. It's just for the first time when you wait for it, then you're like, okay, uh, how long will it take? But two minutes is, is extremely fast to do. We have the new user properties in there. Which is great. Here you can already see, even when you don't have additional events that you want to load uh, into Mixpanel, you always find additional user properties. And if you work a lot with Mixpanel, the properties can do real magic. So they can enable you to, to make really interesting breakdowns of your data. And so this is definitely... So if you want to get started with syncing data from your data warehouse, syncing up user properties, I would say is the best place to start. But if you have watched all the videos, you also know already that uh, even finding events in your data warehouse is not so complicated. Let's go from there. We want to work with the data, finally. One thing that's definitely interesting for us is because now we have both together. We have the behavioral data and we have the subscription data. The first thing that I would like to learn about is so a classic fun funnel. Let's say someone creates a board. Let's say something totally, so totally obvious. In the end, like someone creates a board and then at some point they create a subscription. And this is cool, but if we look at the data, it's not cool. Okay, background. This is a demo data set, so it's generated. And of course, like the demo data set, it, it's based on real behavior of a, a whiteboard application. So it definitely makes sense. But so if this would be my application, I would definitely be concerned because we have about 
56,000 bots that have been created over the last 12 months. And from them, we basically converted into 43 subscriptions. It could be that we were just, let's say as, as a hypothesis, so it could be that we were running a long time on a free product because like, we wanted to get market traction, so we wanted to get a lot of awareness. We gave people access to our product for a long time before adding a paid plan. So this is definitely reasonable so that in the end, like we are now just starting to create subscriptions. But if like the subscription would already work longer, then of course, like it's concerning. But in the end, first of all, like, it's not about if let's say products should be scared a lot. It's more about, okay, now we have really this nice possibility so that in the end we can create different kind of funnels. So we could even say, maybe people should at least share a board to some degree, or oh, let's look at that. And so again, so we can see, okay, look, so many people create a board, so many people share it. And in the end, like we, for example, can say this is a point of time where we say, okay, people understand the value of it. And then again, to see how many subscriptions are adding up for that. This would be like a main funnel that I would use to ch always check over time if, let's say, our product in general is in a healthy state. So if this would be my product, it would definitely not be in a healthy sh shape. But again, so we are talking about a fictitious data set. And so there it's totally fine that when subscription created lagging a little bit. But anyway, so this is a good starting point. The nice thing when you add the subscription data to your behavioral data is that you can always create this full customer journey funnels. And in the end, this is a product, for example, where you don't first have to create an account. So you can test it out. It's like Miro or any kind of other tool. So you don't even need an account to get started. But for example, if we would have this, then we would have even account created here in the front of it. And then we have a full journey of it. And so we have then subscription created. And then, of course, we could also add a subscription renewed and at some point also like sub subscription canceled to really see the whole customer journey as one funnel. In all the projects that I'm working on, I usually have one dashboard that really covers the whole customer journey and then it breaks it down by, by interesting insights. Because if I have a full customer journey, I can, for example, break it down then by interesting information. So for example, like the marketing source. As you can see here, the marketing sources are pretty equally shared between, let's say, at least like from percentage-wise, they perform pretty similar, which definitely is a good reminder to at least add some more randomness into your data set. If you create a synthetic data set, it shows you what you can do with it. Break down the funnel by the different kind of marketing sources that lead to a subscription. And there I give marketing the possibility to work with this funnel to really understand, okay, which kind of marketing campaign are performing better uh, compared to other ones. In the end, of course, like, this might be, let's say, the better overview one there where you can really see, okay, this is the total conversion rate from two subscription created. And there we can see, okay, like the webinar, two, three, three, two, at least like definitely still not really like a great performance, but definitely has a significant better performance than everything else, which is here that doesn't really lead to conversions. This is extremely helpful that we now have this information about product usage, but also about the subscription data. This is step number one. Let's do something else. Speaking of marketing team, we want to help the marketing team. So this was one of the reasons why we wanted to combine these data because we want to help our marketing, customer success or growth team to basically help us to improve the customer journey. And one thing where they definitely want to look at is how we, do we have users which are at a churn risk? As you can see, we haven't had so many subscriptions yet, so we want to hold them very close to us so we don't want to lose them. So how can they do this? So what we can do is we can create a cohort. Cohort means it's like we, we take a selection of users that do specific kind of things. So where we define specific kind of criteria. And this is interesting for analyzers because, of course, we can analyze their behavior, their performance over time. Do they grow? For example, we now create a segment of users at churn risk. And naturally, we want to monitor this segment as well. If it's like growing, if it's maybe even shrinking, which would be good. But the other thing what we can do is we can even use this segment to sync it up with marketing tools to then run specific kind of communication with this specific kind of users. So maybe to figure out, okay, what is missing for you? Can we help you some way? Can we maybe do some trainings with you? And so on. So we have different kind of possibilities. And this is really great because we create an insight. And on the other hand, as a next step, we can immediately apply an action to that. We start that by creating a new cohort. So we call this churn risk 
users. And now we have to define it. As I said, we, we have to define the different kind of criteria that makes this user cohort. So one thing that is definitely interesting for us, of course, like we are looking for users who in the end have a subscription always renewed. So let's say, okay, we look into users who had a subscription renew event in the last 30 days. These are all users who are still on a subscription. Then this tells us just that people are on a subscription. We are interested in, okay, they are on a subscription, but they actually don't really use the tool anymore. Okay, so let's add, add something else. So because we are not just looking for the people who have renewed their subscription over time. No, we're actually looking for people who did not do essential things in the last in the last 30 days so that we can see, okay, actually they have a subscription running, but they're not using the tool. Or maybe we may extend this to, to 60 days. So what do we do? So we have to pick something that identifies them. We could go for example, we take any event. So which would mean like people just do something, but the problem is we also track the subscription here. So at least when they have subscription renewed, they have the subscription renewed event. This will not really help us. In the end, we have to decide which kind of events we want to take into account here. A good candidate is definitely asset added because this is something which we think that people definitely should do in this time when they use the product. If we want to make it, let's say, more precise, we could even go in there and we could then create a new event with, let's say, call it board activities or important or, let's say, essential board activities. And so we can combine, for example, asset added and board viewed to say, okay, when either of both are happening, we count this kind of event. And so then we could use it here or we could basically in the end, like create another criteria here. But we leave it like that because we don't want to overcomplicate it. Let's say we don't even do the last 30 days. We say like the last 60 days because then we think, okay, these people are definitely more at risk. So we have over 5,000 people in this cohort. So these 5,000 people, they all have a subscription running, which we defined here. And they haven't used our product for the last 60 days. At some point, they will look at their credit card items and they will see us and they will think I don't really use them anymore and so they might cancel us. So they are definitely at risk. It's extremely good to monitor them and so what we can now do. So we have created the cohort and just to quickly show you what you can do with it. Here you can select an event but what you can also do is I can select a cohort and can basically check them over time here we can see now how many users are actually over time at churn risk. And as we can see, we are definitely driving on a lot of users which are potential for churn. And so we can start there and then we can even, we can monitor if they actually really churn or not. So we can really learn how our churn risk criteria are, if they're really good or not. So this is extremely helpful. But where I wanted to end up is, as I said, we can help the marketing team to start to reach out to this kind of users to understand why do they actually don't use the product anymore. What we can do is we can go to integrations and then we have the possibility to, in the end, pick a marketing tool, which our marketing team is using, and sync up this cohort data into the marketing tool. So for example, where we would now, maybe we already have it, let's say we already have the email address and the user properties, or if we don't, we could go back now in our BigQuery data set and we could just add the email address here and then again do the same user sync. And then we have the data that our, our marketing team, for example, is using MailChimp. So we can sync up these kind of cohort of users as an audience in MailChimp. And then the marketing team can just draft some messages around to figure out why these people are not using our product anymore. So this is extremely powerful. As you can see here, you have different kind of possibilities. We could even run Facebook ads for them to remind them, hey, come back to our product. Maybe something not so obvious, something, let's say, smarter, but we can even combine this. But this makes it so extremely powerful. We have identified an already a really interesting segment which we can use in our analysis, but now we can even sync it out to marketing tools to give the marketing team possibility to work with them directly. And so in the end, we are about here to improve customer experience. Customer experience have different kinds of angles. Of course, like it's within the product, but it's also like the communication that we have with our customers 
outside of the product. And this is something that we can achieve here. The final thing that I want to look into, is, which I always like, is uh, revenue retention. So revenue retention is something that is extremely interesting for us to understand revenue performance over time because we have to get a good idea how we can plan when we get new users into a subscription, how long we usually keep them in this kind of subscription. Let's have a look. What we can do is when we create retention reports, we need at least two events. So one, which is basically starts the cohort that we will see in a second. So the start event and then the, the repeating event. We could use, let's say, subscription created, makes sense. And then subs subscription renewed is, say, the obvious candidates for that. And so let's take a little bit of longer time. One thing, this is why it doesn't make sense. So subscription, for example, for us happens always just one time a month. And so right now we check the whole retention on a daily base. As you can see here, retention criteria is on a day. So we have to switch this to months and then it all makes more sense. And as you can see here, so this totally makes sense because we choose subscription created as an initial event and then subscription renewed as the follow-up event. We could also have used subscription renewed as the first kind of event, then we would start at the, at the first renewal, which is not really totally true. So for us, it's better to start here because here we can already see that at the moment, 15% of our users stop their subscription when they just started it and don't get to the first renewal, which might be okay. 15% is definitely okay, but in the end, it's something we can investigate. So why we actually get people in a subscription and then at least we lose 15% already. And, but this explained why we start here because like in the first months, there will be no subscription renewed because we are at the moment run on a monthly renewal. So it at least like takes one month to have the first renewal. And then we can see it's like over time, we have to have more data or more months, but let's say we might flatten out somewhere maybe at 10%. So let's say over 12 months, we keep 10% of the users that we got. And so this is first of all a baseline. So it gives us an idea about, okay, when we get a new subscription today, we can basically calculate already projected customer lifetime value just based on these kind of percentages. And then what is even more helpful is this can also be something that we can then monitor over time. So I, for example, love these kind of tables because this table gives us a good idea if things that we're starting to change. So let's assume we haven't really invested a lot in improving our customer retention. And as you can see here, it's pretty constant. It looks like we had some months where, let's say, the May cohort looks a little bit weaker getting out here, but we haven't really done any kind of improvements. But let's assume we do some improvements. So let's assume marketing now takes the action that we saw here, like the churn risk people, and now they start to do communication. Of course, they will not keep everyone, but let's say their communication helps us to get 10% of people to not cancel their accounts. So then we will start to see the impact of that in this table pretty quickly. So maybe we might here then have 86, then maybe we have here 75% in the third month. And so then potentially we already can see an increase of the percentage of people that we keep already in this kind of view. And this makes it so powerful, this kind of report, because we can see on a month-to-month -month basis if our changes that are usually applied here, so let's say we change, we have April, so we change something here, we can then already see from month to month if we can already see an improvement. And we don't have to wait for 12 months to actually see an impact. So we can immediately follow up and see on a monthly basis, okay, does this really work? And this makes this report so powerful. This is also like why I love to have the subscription data in here because I work a lot with this kind of reports, especially really to understand how people develop over time. I think this already should give you a good idea why I took the effort to get the Stripe data, transform it into events, and then sync it up into Mixpanel, and then to run these kind of analyzers that I'm running right now. And just because like, we are just starting here. This, this, is, this is something I did in basically 30 minutes. So like a quick first report. But it shows you the kind of power that you now have because like you have an enriched data set. You combine, or in the end, like we completed the customer journey and we can extend the customer journey even more. So for example, what we could do is the next step is we can figure out uh, our customer support system. If we can get the data from there and if we can get the data in an event form, 
And then we add the customer support uh, data here as well. And this gives us the other possibility to really see, look, which kind of account or how many accounts actually reach out to customer support on how does this impact the subscription performance or how does this impact the product performance. So the more we enrich the data set, the more possibilities we have to understand the customer journey as a whole. And this is like why I like to bring all event data into one place because the sequence analysis that we already did today gives me so many insights, gives me so many interesting patterns that I can follow up, that I can give to marketing, that they can run specific kind of campaigns on, that in the end gives me the possibility to improve customer experience really step by step. This is why I took the effort. And as you can remember, if you really watch all the videos, it's not so much effort to bring all this data together. We brought new events pretty straightforward into Mixpanel. Today, we brought new user properties even more straightforward into Mixpanel. And so the process of enriching my setup is definitely something that can fit perfectly in your existing data engineering or analytics engineering process. So it fits perfectly in the data pipelines that you already have. In the end, we're just adding another presentation layer and another endpoint where the data then gets synced automatically from here. And so I hope this whole series across all the videos that we now did about this motivates you to talk to product or to growth or if you are in product and growth to talk to your data team and show them the videos and it's like this is actually what we want to have so we want to have enriched data sets because enriched data sets unlocks so many more insights unlocks so many more potentials to identify interesting patterns in the data that then helps you to make better decisions and to improve the customer journey so i hope the whole series was helpful for you. I will follow up in the next videos and pick specific topics around all these things about event data in the data warehouse, about enriching data sets with warehouse data in product analytics. So I will pick specific kind of topics. So make sure that, first of all, you subscribe so that you don't miss these videos. And also, I'm always very happy when someone likes my video. So please give it up and see you in the next video.